Hey, welcome back. I hope everybody's well. It's good to see you again. Today on my bench, I have something a little different. Uh, this is a Phillips tape player. Yes, Phillips tape player. Now, this was brought to me by a chap uh, local to me, a friend of mine. Um, he, al he also brought me a few other pieces to work on. And uh, I just finished serving, servicing his Akai. It was a GX265D. And, um, and that was quite an evolved process of bringing that tape player, tape recorder back to life and getting working good again. That video, I'm having troubles editing um, in my, my editing software. So I don't know if that video will ever see the light of day. I hope, it, I, hope I can get that video out because it's a good video. It's a long one, has a lot of... Uh, information in it but uh like i'm still struggling with getting that one rendered but this unit is uh from his collection as well um this is a seven and a half inch uh, reel player a recorder and uh, it has typical phillips fashion it has a speaker in the lid you can detach the lid and you can use this as one of your stereo speakers the other speaker obviously is built into the device so let's put this aside for now so it doesn't get damaged. He wants this uh, machine gone over, make sure it's all 100% working, and uh, he's got a, a use for it. The reason he wants this machine is because it has a slow speed 7 and 1 8 inch per second tape speed, and uh, the Akai I just finished uh, restoring for him only has 3 and 3 quarters and 7 and a half. So this is why he wants to use this machine. I guess he's got some tapes of his family uh, his father he wants to have them uh, dig digitized i guess to preserve them so he's looking for a machine that will do that for him and here it is so i don't know anything about this machine um we don't even know what model it is i can't find a plate that has a model number on it i think it probably long fell off but let's look at the features on the front it's got uh, tone control volume balance and it's got two level inputs one for your phono radio input and one for your microphone input and then it's got your typical start stop rewind record it's got a tape counter and it looks like it has a vacuum tube uh, one of those i vacuum tubes maybe this is a tube unit yes i do see a vacuum tube in there so maybe this is all a vacuum tube unit um, I have a couple of other Philips machines here that are old vacuum tube units, but they don't look modern styled like this. This looks like late 69, maybe it's 1970, I'm guessing, as a, as a, as a guess. Anyways, let's look at the back of the unit or the top. It has speaker outputs for right and left. Uh, an output for a headphone jack and it has a line output this is what he wants to use to uh, dub from tape to his uh, recorder he wants me to make up a patch cord that will fit this quarter inch phono plug and provide um, RCA jacks so he can hook it up to his other machines um, left and right phono radio phono input and then it's got a microphone input I don't know if that's stereo or mono I'm not sure the bottom is not much. There's a little door that hides the power cord. Pretty typical for Phillips machines. So let's turn this on and see what we can get out of it. Maybe it's, it's already working fine. We don't know. If it's got vacuum tubes in it, I'm sure there's going to be a little bit of um, work in the checking capacitors out and whatnot. So let's plug this thing in. And figure out how to turn it on give me a second okay i got it plugged in there's a power switch here on the left off on so i can turn it on you can hear a motor going change different speeds we've got our little eye tube lit up and you can see that problem is this thing was never intended to be 
operated standing up like this because there is no lock for the reels. And if you, I suppose the reel would just fall off if you're trying to use it stood up. Plus, all the controls are under here. So I guess this is intended to be used in a horizontal position only. Um, I just want to take this cover off and inspect the heads before we start running tape through it. So we got our capstan rolling. And it does look very dirty in here. Let's see what we get as far as playback. And volume. It's working. Seems to be working okay. It's picking up my magnetic screwdriver. Balance, so I don't have the other speaker hooked up. Okay, so it seems to be working. It just needs a clean. Yeah. Needs a cleaning. Rewind. Pause, fast forward. Yeah, some awful noises. It probably needs lubrication and everything. So we got a switch over here, a couple switches. PAR, ST, which I think stands for stereo. And then I think you can select track one and four or track two and three. The switch is like it's frozen. I'm not gonna force it. Now this switch here, DP0MP. I don't know what this is either, and it seems frozen. So let's load up a tape and see what kind of noise we can get out of this thing. I expect it to be fully working. All right, so we're loaded up. I found a, oops, sorry. I found another Maxell tape in my stash. I got dust on it. Look at this. This is a uh, Maxell UDXL. Uh, new epitaxial particle, XL Professional. It's back coated. Uh, this is a 90 minute tape, 96 minutes in uh, one direction. And today, for our listening pleasure, we have The Damned live at Shepperton, recorded in 1980, and on the other side, The Dream Syndicate. I don't know if we'll get to that far, but let's try out The, uh, the Damned. Okay, well we know it works, on this channel anyway, you can try the other channel. I think it just needs a good cleaning. And uh, let me do that right now. Let's get the tape out of here and we'll clean those heads. And uh, we'll have a good look at it and see how it sounds. No auto shut off, okay. These guides are really worn. Like I'm looking at, I'm looking at brass here that's been worn away. So that's, yeah, there's a lot of wear on these. I've seen a lot of hours, this, this tape machine. Look at the slop in this bearing, it's just like,
I think it needs a lubrication and an adjustment. Well, we first need to figure out what model this is so I can pull up a service manual. Oh, and this is loose. That's a uh, tape guide there. It's loose. Have to address that. Okay, let's get some cleaner on this. Wow. Yeah, this pin troll is filthy. I just keep cleaning it till it comes clean. going I don't think this pinch roller has ever been clean look at the filth that's coming off just keeps getting layer upon layer Wow, let's do some more. Keep going. This might be an hour video of me cleaning heads here, so bear with me. Wow, it's filthy. Okay, well, I'll do that off camera because it's going to take me a while to clean that roller. I might even have to remove it and clean it by hand. But uh, everything appears to be going good. These little felt pads here, they're contaminated with oxides as well. It looks like I've got some fuzz in here. Be nice if I could replace these pads. It looks like it is replaceable. Or clean them somehow. I don't know if I can clean them. Because they're probably got 40, 50 years of dirt and oxides in them. There's another pad here. Okay, well let's take this cover off and see what we can get access to as far as um, you know, uh, lubrication, any adjustments, uh, cleaning, and the circuitry. Let's just have a look inside. 
Maybe we can find a maybe we can find a uh, model number in there too. Four screws and one knob, and we're in. So it's pretty easy. And what do we have here? Wow. Big belt here. It seems to be doing good. Let's turn this on again. I don't know if that's supposed to come off. Is it clutch? And a belt here that's pretty much perished. Not much left of it. Main motor. Here's our eye tube. Wow. Okay. How does it run this way? Because this is a intended operating position. It's nice and quiet. Wow, this tire is really messed up. It's yeah, it's weird. It doesn't work. Okay, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the back off and have a look in the back too. All right, four more screws and we're in. Let's have a look. Wow, look at this thing. Check out that power transformer. Look at this little fuse here. I got it unplugged, by the way. There's our motor. A little power supply board here. This thing's got some age to it. We've got germanium transistors here and tube I guess this is the tube outputs because we got two transformers here I'm assuming those are our output transformers we got a tone board here with all our pots mounted to it and it's a little bit loose you've got ECL 882s Who makes these? Patented Canada. Rogers. This tube is hot. This one not so much. 
Yeah, so we're going to have a little bit of a fun time here. We're going to have to be checking capacitors, grid capacitors, all kinds of blocking capacitors. Um, check out these switches. They're going to need to be cleaned. Uh, oh boy. Thankfully we got no bad transistors yet that we know of. Electrolytics, they're all stood up. Yeah, so we're going to have to give this a complete going over. It's going to be a while. Just the lubrication portion of it is going to be a while. I don't know what this thing is. There's a hole here. And I can see a threaded rod in there. And I see this threaded rod. I don't know what that does. There's a speed selector. Interesting. A lot of interesting stuff in here. The capstan. You know how far out of adjustment that is. It's got a cover on the flywheel. Why? It doesn't even look like it's attached to the flywheel. It's spinning independent. All right, we got a lot of work ahead of us. That's for sure. Mainly concerned about this tube portion. So, where do we start? I think I'll start with the electronics, checking over all the capacitors and electro electrolytics here. I'm not sure what I'm going to find, if anything. It was working. Seems like we have a power amplifier here. And this is all pre-amplifier, uh, you know, everything else, the record amp. But uh, yeah, this is kind of interesting design. So we still need to figure out what kind of um, model number this is. So let me go look at some service manuals. Maybe I can figure this out if I recognize this layout at all. Got a little relay here. A relay. Big fat bumblebee cap there, or diode there. It's all glass. I don't know if you can see that. You can't see it. It's in between. Kind of interesting. Let me get the camera and I'll sh give you a tour around. So here's the flywheel. It's got this plastic cover on it. These tires look okay. Here's the main transformer. It's got a thermal fuse in it. It's got another fuse here. I think this is a power switch. And the motor. The motor is mounted on rubber block. Just to suppress vibration. Power supply back here. It's got big electrolytic, a couple smaller ones. It's got no voltage regulation that I can see. Unless there's a transistor somewhere that's dissipating some heat. And this is the uh, volume pot board. We've got a few components on the other side. I don't know yet. haven't taken that out. This here looks like the power amplifier. Two open transformers, two tubes. And then all the electronic switching. There's two boards here, one for each channel I'm assuming because they're identical. Stereo, more caps, more caps, more caps. Quite a few uh, tantaliums that I'm seeing. If those are actually tantaliums, they're color coded, so I don't know what values they are. Pretty 
pretty interesting. Let's look at the other side. All right, here's the piano keys, all the mechanical linkages. They're all pretty stiff. You have to push really hard. I think this whole machine could use a lubrication. Take up reel. And this tire is not perished, it's just really lumpy and deformed. There's another tire here. And there's a great big O-ring belt. This belt's perished, it's, you see cracks in it. It's very stretchy. It's almost like a rubber band somebody put on there. Here's the eye tube. I'll leave that alone, it's probably an Octavium. This, this counter didn't seem to be working. The, the, oh, maybe it is. Yeah, it is. Okay. Power switch. everything. Okay, let's start with the electronics and we'll uh, work our way through this thing one from one end to the other. It's going to be quite a job, I think. Got a lot to do here. A lot of lubrication, a lot of cleaning, and uh, hopefully not too much adjustments. All right, the good news is I found the model number. This is an EL Sorry, EL3555. Uh, I got the service manual. Bad news is it's all in German, so I can't understand a word of it. But I think I can piece together enough of the pictures and the diagrams and the, and the text to figure out what they're talking about for adjustments. And uh, <clears throat> the main thing is I have the component placement list parts, list, uh, kind of, sorry, the component placement uh, diagrams and I have schematics and we can get through this. But look at this board. I don't know what, what's going on with this. I pulled this out. This part here. What is that part? Uh, I think that is Oh, that's not right. Is this upside down or is this backwards or what is this? This is upside down. Okay, that's C25. This thing, it looks like all the paint come off of it. This one's R157. And uh, yeah, this all matches up. Capacitor here. I want to check some of these capacitors because uh, I want to make sure that they're good before we continue with, uh, I think, I think they probably are, but I just want to make sure. So, um, can get busy on the pot cleaning. I got the pots out. Uh, I checked all these electrolytics. They're good. I checked these ones. They're good. I still have to check these five or six here. And I want to check these uh, grid, these blocking capacitors. Make sure they're good too. Okay, just going through the electronics here. Uh, checking, mostly concerned about the power amplifier board. I did change one capacitor. Um, it's a, <coughs> what is this, a point uh, zero three three. And uh, kind of questionable on the test, but whatever, I changed it. And I test pulled these other caps out, and tested them there fine, I put them back in. Everything else is good. Uh, some of these resistors aren't the greatest either. They're probably 10% or more out. Especially uh, some of these have uh, gold bands on them, so I might relook at that, I don't know yet. Um, this volume board, I replaced four caps. 
these are all these are basically the DC blocking caps before the, the signal goes into the power amplifier these two wires the yellow wires um, that's the signal for the power amplifier so I replaced these two blocking caps and there was a couple electrolytics here that were really weak so I replaced them with film and they're in the tone circuit uh, tested all the ones on the power supply and uh, except for these weird caps I don't know these th these things are weird what are they like why are they I don't know if there's a ceramics or what they are but I might replace these two as well I don't know these electrolytics are okay for the most part Haven't really looked much on the main board here. There's still a bunch of electrolytics I haven't checked. I checked these two cards. Everything seems good on them. So I'm leaving them alone. And uh, what else? Just getting on to some lubrication and cleaning. Um, I think that's gonna be next. I think I'm pretty much done with the electronics aside from this board here. I still wanna uh, test these caps and uh, but aside from that, I think we're done. And then it's all a matter of just lubrication and uh, cleaning. I already found some stuff that was seized with old grease, so I already freed that up. So I'm going to do some more of that here. So I'm going to service this motor now. It's time to do that, I think. I took the wires off and pull this. Pull off the backing plate. And I already removed the belt from the other side. So this should just lift right out. Oh, we got wires on this side too, okay. so And we got a ground wire here, okay. Let's get rid of this ground wire. free a lot of dust built up in this I don't think it's been lubricated oh we got a nut on the other side here yes we do This uh, pulley is uh, in, uh, interchangeable. Um, if you want to switch it to 50 cycles, 50 hertz, you would flip this, take this pulley off and flip it over and use the other, uh, the other grooves. But since we're in 60 hertz North America, we're just going to leave that, leave that alone. the the dirt in here it's basically why I want to take it apart and clean all this out
We got a little set screw for the fan. So everything's looking good. Just need to relubricate and clean it and put it back together. All right. There's a ball bearing in there. on the end of the shaft, ball bearing. Okay, so let's put this back together. Well, that's interesting. a set screw here. Yeah, I'll bolt this back together and then we'll uh, fire it up. Okay, the one thing you gotta 
keep in mind is there's a lot of slop in these holes so that the bearings aren't centered on the, the bore. So you have to get it there. This is working good. It's not rubbing anymore. It was rubbing in a while ago, but it's nice and smooth and silent. I think that's good for the motor. Put that aside and we'll do something else. Okay, so I've been doing a lot of work here at Electronics. Um, done the testing of the electrolytics and some of the other uh, high voltage caps, you know, all checking out good. Uh, done the cleaning and uh, relubricating of the, the five pots, the stereo pots. There's five of them here. Uh, that's all complete, put it back together. Uh, I left the main amplifier board, power amplifier board out because I want to do, my next step is I want to clean these switches. Uh, I think there's what, seven of them here? Four, five, six, six switches. And I want to clean these with uh, contact cleaner and deoxid. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this, um, the way I see doing this, probably the easiest way rather than removing the board is uh, just there's these links here these mechanical links and they're held in with a c-clip or e-clip whatever you want to call them I'm just going to remove this e-clip be very careful not to lose it and then maybe we can take out this link which is exactly what I was hoping for and then we can take out the uh, switch body itself, the, the slider. We can take this out. Okay. Now we got to remember that this is orientated, these marks go to the top. But uh, now that I got it out, I can see where the dirt is on the slides. This is all gold plated. Let's take a, um, let's get some contact. No, I'm not gonna use alcohol. Let's use contact cleaner. I'm just gonna use this LPS stuff. I gotta use it up because it lost the uh, spray nozzle on it. So we're just gonna clean this up. Yeah, it's, See all the dirt coming off there. You can actually see it coming clean. Okay. It's good enough for what I'm going with. Now let's add a little deoxid. Spread it throughout. Let me use too much. And let's slide this back in. So as we work that, that's gonna get better with uh, Just work that deoxid back in there. Let me pull it out again. Yeah, it's working. Now these are very brittle. It's just a, a little slim piece of printed circuit board and, and it will break if you flex it. So we don't want that. Let's put that back in and then we can work on to the next one. So I'll do all six of these uh, I won't show them on camera, but uh, you get the idea how it works. And uh, that's pretty much all there is to it. And then aside from that, I think we are done. I checked these capacitors. They're good. Everything on the electronics so far has been good. Um, no issues with the electronics, but then it was working when we first initially tested it. So I'm going to finish the switches. And then I have another couple of things to take care of. Let's see here. I lubricated the motor. I lubricated the capstan. 
uh, I lubricated this mechanism under here with this relay. Uh, I still have a few idler wheels to lubricate and clean. And then I'm going to flip the whole thing over and then we're going to start working on the other side, mechanics. All right, so I'm going through doing lubrication of all the mechanicals. And I ran into a little problem here. Not really a big problem, it's a little tiny problem actually. Uh, this is one idler wheel that sits here and it uh, interface between the this drive and this take up reel. Um, you see they have these felt washers, these rings, and this one came unattached. And I think just the adhesive they used perished. It's probably like a sticky tape or something they used back in the day. Uh, you can see it's lifting off, but this came apart. Now, you notice this side has one too. And this wheel has one, and this wheel has one, and this wheel has one. I, you're wondering what these felt washers are for. Um, I believe they're there to just absorb. If somebody comes in here with an oil can and goes crazy, um, it's it's uh, to absorb the oil. If if you over oil this bearing, the oil is going to want to flow because these are spinning, right? These discs are spinning. The oil is going to flow from the center out to the edge, and it's going to contaminate this rubber. So they put these uh, felt washers on there to capture that oil and hold it to keep it from going and contaminating the rubber, the rubber belts, the rubber tires and whatnot. So I'm really looking at this. I could re-glue it back on with a little bit of, uh, just take this off, a little bit of, clean that up, a little bit of silicone uh, adhesive, just put a little thin layer and then just plunk this back down and it'll be there uh, good or you could just remove it and uh, you know never use oil because I'm using a fine grease I'm using a, a synthetic grease for all of these bearings and uh, it's not going to flow like oil will but I think I'm just going to put this back on and glue it anyway just so it's all original and uh, but uh, just to show you a few things here's another one I think this one might even be this one's just oh it was glued in there see it's like an adhesive tape they use and it's all perished so maybe i'll glue these back on with some uh, silicone i have some silicone here i'll just uh, put a really fine layer down and then plunk that felt washer and it's all good so what i'll do is i'll just show you how i uh, use silicone adhesive for this uh, got silicone right here get a toothpick get a little bit of just need a tiny amount not very much and uh, actually I got too much here so let's take some of this and put it here okay and just put a little a small amount all we want to do is just bond that felt washer back down to the metal I clean this with aluminum first or sorry I clean the aluminum with uh, alcohol first just so that it uh, the silicone has a better chance to adhere so where is my washer let's put this one down and That's all it needs, just to tack it down again. I'll do this one. I made a mess of this already. Let me clean this up. I don't want a mess like that. Okay, so let's get another dab. Let's put a small amount. And this will uh, set up in no time. Just want to get some of this away from the bearing. Mm. 
there. Just let that set up. It won't take long. It's a very small amount of silicone. It'll take probably an hour or so to set up. And then I will hold that felt pad down and uh, it won't fall off again. All right, so I'm going to reassemble all this and relubricate it. Um, I did this idler already, this tire. This one's been lubricated. This one's been lubricated. Um, this has been lubricated. I still got to go through and do a lot of stuff here just to finish this off and then we can start um, going to testing. All right, so let's have a look at the head block here. Um, first of all, what I did is I removed the, uh, the eye tube. The eye tube sits here in this with this socket. And I removed it just so I didn't damage it. I just wanted to get it out of the way. Um, let's have a look at the transport system here on this. Uh, we need some pliers. So this side, this is the, uh, what do you want to call it? The input side is where the tape comes from. There's a tape guide here and this is adjustable. You can see you can adjust the height and um, this whole thing is mounted on a spring so it can go up and down but as you tighten it down it, it drops. But if you look at, let me loosen this right off here. I don't know if you can see this. I'm going to spin this. There's a little, uh, look at the wear on this thing. It's quite a bit of wear. I'm going to try cleaning it so you can see it better. Or maybe it won't. That's look like, looks like corrosion on there. I don't know if you can see that. But there's a, a metal sleeve. It's round. It's got a groove cut in the middle of it, in the center. And the the sleeve is made of brass and it's plated with a silver metal, probably nickel. But um, we can see right here it's worn through so bad that the um, the brass is showing underneath and it's all flattened. And there's actually two spots. There's one here and there's another one here which is not as bad. You can see it. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to rotate this to a part that's not being used and uh, snug that down if I can hold it straight this will have to be adjusted this here is your erase head and I think I gave it a cleaning it looks like it's pretty good it's pretty clean and I don't feel any wear on the erase head so that's all looking good this uh, felt pad that rests against it if I was doing a full restoration, I'd be replacing that felt pad if I could find one that's suitable. So we work our way across the to the right here. This is the record playback head. And unfortunately, this one shows a lot of wear. You can see that on camera, but I'll try cleaning it a little bit. If you uh, run your fingernail over it, you can feel there's some quite deep grooves because there is the uh, the metal case, and then the, you see the two heads there, one in the bottom, one in the top. Um, in this compound that they use to epoxy, it's like an epoxy um, filler that they use to pot the uh, the tape heads in the case, and that's probably what's worn the most. It's that brown epoxy. And then, of course, you got another felt pad here. This can be changed. Looks like it can be changed. I don't know how you would take that apart. There's a pin there holding it. Uh, another guide. Another. This one's non-adjustable. But if I loosen it, you can see. If I spin it around, there's one flat spot on here, quite bad too, if you can see that flat spot. So yeah, you want to turn the roller or the, the sleeve so that it's showing fresh material to wear against. This is your capstan. It's all been lubricated. It's working good. 
and there is another guide post here that has a lot of wear on it. If you can see, if I turn it around, you can see the wear on this one. And that's quite deep, these grooves. There's a groove there, you can feel it with your fingernail. That's quite, you see the brass underneath. So again, I'm just gonna rotate this one so it's exposing fresh material. Tighten it down. And then there is another post here, which I have removed right at the moment. Let me see if I can find it somewhere here. It's on my bench. And you can see this is the, uh, the post and how worn it is. It's got two spots. One's really deeply worn and the other one not so bad. And then there's a, a nut for on top to adjust it. So this goes like this. And then I'll, of course, I'll rotate that so it's exposing fresh material. And then we have a post here, which is for the capstan roller. This roller sits here like this. Sorry, yeah, like that. And runs up against. This one I'm in the middle of cleaning right now. You can see how dirty it was. I'm trying to clean it. It takes a little bit of a while. You gotta scrub it with, um, Alcohol doesn't do a great job, but contact cleaner seems to work pretty good on these. And you want to scrub it right back down to the rubber. You can get rid of all of this oxide coating and get rid of all that uh, contamination there. And uh, I'll finish working on this off camera, get it cleaned up. And I might probably give it a uh, wipe down with some rubber renew. Although this rubber feels perfect. Like it's got a nice uh, feel to it. It's not cracked, it's not dried up. It's not hard so I think once I get it cleaned this this oxide coating probably protected the rubber in uh, in a in a way and I still need to remove the pin and lubricate this because it's not lubricated you hear it the bearing is dry and it's making that squawk noise so we're gonna lubricate that because that's uh, an important part and then aside from that we're gonna have to do an alignment so there's not much to align on this. We only got the one head. Um, basically is you're gonna be aligning the intake post to, for the tape height or tape position. And then as it goes across, this one here is, this one here is fixed. So the head is adjusted in relation to this one. This was fixed. This one here will be fixed as well. Um, but that's okay because it's actually on the exit side. So it doesn't matter if that one is out of position or not. And uh, yeah, we're gonna get this running. And then, then it's just a matter of doing some tests. So I'll finish cleaning that roller, uh, finish lubricating the chassis. I'm just about done lubricating the chassis and then we're gonna start doing some testing. All right, so we run into a little bit of a problem. Uh, I was lubricating the keys and uh, this is the, well, this is a stop key, play, fast forward, rewind, pause. And the pause is got this latching mechanism here. And I was lubricating this and then it stopped working. I was, what the hell is going on here? So I lifted this up and I took a look inside here. You can see, you can see this plastic here that holds, there's a, there's a little tiny roll pin. You can see this little roll pin. It fits in this hole down here and it sticks out and then it latches on this mechanism. Um, the plastic's all broken. So you can see the plastic's all broken around here. And uh, that's not good because this no longer works as a pause button. It doesn't latch. So, but that's not the, that's not that bad because uh, if you look at this here, let me show you something. Let me show you something here. See, this is a pause key, and here's the plastic that's broken on the side with the. Uh... But if you look at these other keys, they're all identical. 
and they all have that plastic boss. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the uh, keys apart and I'm going to swap keys, probably stop it with the stop key because the stop key doesn't latch at all. And it uh, doesn't really matter which one I use. There's four here I can pick from. And uh, we'll swap that out and get this working again. As long as it holds that roll pin in place and then it can latch on the mechanics here, we can uh, get this working again. So I got to take out a few springs, a few screws and a few other springs and remove this assembly. Uh, take out this pin and uh, remove this shaft and then rearrange the keys, put it all back together. So it won't, won't take me long, maybe a few minutes. And this is why it's good to take things apart sometimes. Look at the mess under here. It's just a, a nasty, nasty mess. It's got dust. This felt uh, is no longer, it's, this felt should be glued to that metal back because it's a cushion for when the keys for when the keys are released. And look at these keys. I don't know if you can see these here. Here how filthy everything is. Clean all this stuff off. So that's a, you know, it's good to take this apart sometimes and just get all this crap out of here and get it all uh, cleaned up. But look at this key. This key has got a crack. Um, you can see the crack it starts over here and it goes through this boss and then it goes all the way back to here so this key's done for what i'm going to do is i'm just going to swap it probably for the uh, stop key this is the stop key and it's not cracked at all so yeah that's the problem when you got 50 60 year old plastics they, they tend to uh, give up but I'll get this cleaned up and back together again. Okay, we're finishing up in the home stretch here. Um, pretty much got all the lubrication done on the top. There's quite a bit going on here, uh, more than I realized. The uh, There's so many little mechanical levers and struts and springs and like even this little power switch. There's all these little parts and linkages and springs and uh, it, and then there's a, a shaft that goes under there and it moves something under there and it does you know, like it's it's crazy um, this switch was seized it had uh, I wasn't able to move it but now I got it freed up and it seems to be working good now this switch here was also seized but it's coming back and a lot of these you just got to make sure, you know, put the machine through its paces and, and see where all the points, the lever points are and the contact points and the slide points and just lubricate. This thing hasn't been lubricated in 50 years, you can tell. And it's working good now. Yeah, it's... But um, for right now, I still have a few things to do. Uh, I just want to put this uh, iTube in. Here's an iTube if you ever never seen one before. This is a Rogers EM87 6HU6 and it's got a, um, a phosphorus painted on the inside of the glass envelope and uh, that's what uh, provides the light and then it shoots a beam. It's got this little assembly inside. I think there's a, a filament you can see the wire is going in the side. I think there's a filament going on in there. And uh, yes, of course there is. And there's a little bit of an active element back here. You can see the uh, emissions staining the inside of the glass. And uh, yeah, it's kind of an interesting tube. I don't think they use the active element. I think they just use the display portion. I'm not sure. I don't know. I'm guessing here. So let's put this back together. I took this out because I didn't want to damage it. And uh, yeah, watch me break it on camera. I'll be crying. This isn't a very good setup either. They got this brass plate and it hooks on, but it doesn't hook on very good. It uh, wants to, yeah, I got to get that centered somehow. So let's push this and hook it. I 
I don't want to break the glass, that's the thing. I just want to go easy. There we go. Okay, that's in there. Uh, other than that, it still needs a belt. I haven't picked out the belt yet. This one here is like, it looks like somebody put a rubber band on it. That is not a proper belt. You can see how it's all rotten and stretched. So I need a belt for the counter, but uh, for right now, I think you can plug it in and try it out. Let's turn the power off. I do not have speaker hooked up and I do not have the output tubes installed, so we won't get any audio. That was switched on. It's running a lot quieter. Let's put it through some paces here. Play. Play, pause. Rewind, no, fast forward. Come on, you can do it. This spring is too short, too long. I think I need to make an adjustment here, hang on. Well, this is still loose anyway. Yeah. See, this rubber wheel is not the greatest. It's not. Uh, it's not round. It's out of round. That's why it's making a weird noise. Rewind. It's working good. Ow! Yeah, and you get electrocuted if you touch the circuit board. So be careful. So I think we're uh, we're good now. Oh, I got to align the tube a little better. It's not centered. How's that? It's a lot better. So mechanically, I think everything's working. Record. Hmm. Pause, play. Yeah. Okay, so I think we're ready to do tape alignment. And uh, what I'll do is I'll get the tapes loaded, to do a rough alignment, and then we'll uh, do the fine tuning when we got the audio back up again. But I think we're just about done. I am gonna put this back in the case. I'll plug this before I electrocute myself again. Uh, put this back in the case because it uh, it'll hold it up off the table and. Uh, then we can hook the speaker back up. We're going to do the tape alignment. I have it spooled up with the tape. Uh, like I mentioned at the beginning, this is the Damned Live at Shepperton, 1980. So it's probably all copyrighted and uh, probably going to get flagged for this, but it's all in the name of repair, right? I got it in uh, pause standby mode. It is uh, tapes all spooled up. The amplifiers, both amplifiers are working, I believe. Turn it to the right. You can hear the right channel, left channel. So uh, everything's working with the amplifiers. Um, all we need to do now is uh, adjust the head. I adjusted this intake post or the feed post, whatever you want to call it. And what I did is I aligned it to match up with the erase head um, here. This erase head, I believe, has no adjustment. I don't see any adjustment for the erase head. Or is it all part of the same? It seems to be tied in together. And there's a spring there, so. That's stationary, I'm pretty sure. This is adjustable. This head's adjustable. There's three adjustments. One in the back, 
one in the back, one in the front is for your height, the head height. And it also adjusts the head forward or backwards like this. There's one adjustment on the side here, which will tilt the head this way. And that's going to give us our, uh, our adjustment. So let's uh, play the tape. Lowering the, lowering the head a bit. Okay. Let's try the azimuth. That's way out. Back down again. Right about there. Seems to be the sweet spots right there. But I want to. And that's going to do it right there. That's as best as we can get. And it sounded pretty good actually, considering it's from 1966 and uh, you know it's, it's got tube amp and uh, single cone speakers. Actually not too bad sound, pretty good fidelity. Turn the bass, turn up the treble. It goes pretty loud. Check some of the other features here, functions. Make sure all the drive functions are working. This one's called Melody Lee. I don't like the brake on the left reel isn't working as efficient as it should be. Yeah, the rewind and fast forward mechanisms are not the greatest in the brakes, but it's working. I don't like that. Ah, drum solo.
Okay, so we are on stereo. Let's see. If I'm not exactly sure what this does. It selects between, let's see here. This is, I haven't read the instructions on this thing, but PAR, whatever that is. ST, I'm assuming is stereo. Uh, tracks one and four and tracks two and three. But if you can switch between the, these different tracks, there's only a two head, um, two track head here. So I don't know how they're doing that. And they're not doing it. Uh, they're just saying it's, maybe I misunderstand this, but it is not working as intended or but everything's working uh let's put this uh back together and finish it up and then we'll do a test record all right so one of the things the owner requested for this uh phillips tape deck is he wants to use it for uh, dubbing his uh, family tapes He's got some old tapes that he wants to dub onto uh, another medium, either digitize them or whatever. And he asked if he could, uh, if I could build them or figure out a way to get the uh, a line level output signal out of the tape deck. And there are no RCA uh, plugs in the back. There's only the quarter inch phone jack. So I'm gonna build him um, an adapter that he can use with this tape deck and feed it into conventional RCA inputs. And he can either record it onto another medium or digitize it, whatever he needs to do with this. So I just got a, a cheap Chinese uh, patch cable here, this audio video one. I'm just gonna pull off the video line cause we don't need it and just use it as an audio cable. And I'll throw this aside, throw that aside need that so let's uh what i have here is i have quarter inch phone jack in stereo oh come on i only need one and a cover so we can uh, build that for him right now just really quick you can buy these you can go order them they're already rca to quarter inch phono stereo mono um, probably just cheaper just to make one rather than try and build um, buy one because they're uh, so easy to make so what do we do here we got a right channel left channel and we have a stereo phono plug so typically the tip is uh, left channel, the ring is called tip, ring, and then I don't know what they call this, it's a common, I guess, ground. Tip and ring, ring is usually right, uh, tip is left, and um, you can see how this is. If you can't figure out how they got this, get your continuity tester out and figure it out. It's pretty simple. The case goes back to this. And the tip goes to the coaxial tip goes to the very end here. And your ring goes to this connector. So we'll uh, hook this up grounds and then right and left. So let's strip this. Leave this aside, strip this here. And uh, yeah, there's not much to it. I'm just gonna put together a simple cable. The grounds get, the shielding is your ground and they get combined into one. 
good enough. And then we have our right and our left. Okay, so we need to figure out, let's take this ground and feed it through this lug. These out of the way for now. I'm just going to give this a wrap here so it's just want to give this a wrap. Cut off the excess. Need some new cutters, these ones are so dull. Okay, let's solder this up. Yeah, this is shorting out here. Why doesn't that want to wrap properly? Okay, I think I got it. Let's throw this out of this one. I think I need something to hold everything. easier. Okay, we got that. Let's do the left and we'll put the left cut off this much, strip that much, tin it. Now this is where it gets kind of tricky because you don't want to overheat the um, you don't want to overheat the uh, soldering. It's a little cup here, so I'm just going to put solder in the cup and start heating it up. Good. Now, oh, I put this on. You gotta remember to put this on before you start soldering because uh, otherwise you'll be desoldering to put it on after, which is uh, not something you wanna be doing. Okay, let's solder this. Get a little more angle on this thing. Tin this. And tin this. And then we can just Okay, we're done. Now we want to crimp. This looks like crap. Oh, that's already broken. Look at that. Oh my god. I wasn't pulling on that. Let's do it again. it all apart and do it again because this is not good.
clean this off. Start from scratch. Okay, let's start from scratch. We'll do it over again. So we strip these. It's not very good wire. It's not the best wire. It's very, very flimsy. Come on. Let's crimp this so it doesn't break on me next time. Crimp that. Okay. First, we'll do the left channel. Do the right channel. I hope that reaches. Yeah, it will. This is I'm I'm right-handed here, and this is a left-handed. Okay, we're good. We are done. Just check the wiring, make sure there's no shorts. Everything should be good. Close this up. And then voila, there you have it. One adapter cable. 
All right, so I got the tape set up to play. I have uh, the amplifier I'm using is the Realistic STA20. I'm feeding it in through the line inputs with using our new cable we just made. So let's test it out. Turn this down, turn this up. Yeah, so it's working good. I got the power amplifier in here. Balance, got left channel, right channel. So it's working. Let's uh, try recording a few tones and uh, see if the record function works. And then after that, I think I'm just going to wrap this up. I don't think he'll be using it for recording. I just want he just wanted to use it for uh, playing back tapes and dubbing them to a different uh, medium or digitizing, like I said. So let's just uh, try this out and um, see if we can get it to record. I'm sure it will. So I got a one volt peak to peak signal I um, got from my single generator and it's split into two cables. And I can plug these directly into the back because there are two RCA inputs here for left and right channel. They're inputs for the radio phono function of this. So that you can use the internal amplifier for powering a radio and or a phono or a, yeah, a phono player. So we got the signal going. Let's see if we can get anything on the inputs here. Okay, let's put this into record mode. That's locked out. And that's locked out. Why is that? Here we go. Here's our signal. And our level meter is working. You can turn this up till we hit peak. Right there. And we can start recording. Try some different frequencies. Two kilohertz, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, good enough. Should be getting a tone here pretty soon. I'm getting a stereo signal. Left channel's a little bit weak. You hear there's quite a bit of flip. Quite 
quite a bit of flutter on the uh, on the uh, tape. I wonder why the race head's not working. Well, it's working. For 1966, I think it's doing pretty good. Well, it all seems to be functioning, and I'm going to wrap this up, give the uh, owner a call, let him know it's ready for pickup, and I uh, hope he's pleased. Uh, it's a nice unit for uh, what it is. It's um, 1966 vintage. It's uh, quite a player, a recorder too, and uh, to see it survive this long and still work, it's quite, quite a good sight. Anyways, I'm going to wrap this up and I am going to uh, call it a day on this one. So again, thanks again for watching and I hope to see you on the next one. Take care.